Number three, if the, if the company changes their name, I got to tell the commission. Anytime there's a change in managing broker, branch manager, address, anything like that, I've got to keep the commission current of where my actual place of business is. Now, when you apply for your license, and I told you something a minute ago that you would also have it signed by me, you can also have your license in what they call unassigned status or inactive status. Inactive status, you actually have to apply for that. You have to go from active to inactive. You don't just say, oh, I'm now not active. The state's not going to know that you're inactive unless you make application to transfer your license from active to inactive. And if you're going to do this, you have to make the uh, application. Now, you cannot do it, number letter B, you cannot move your license to inactive if you're in the middle of a disciplinary lawsuit. So in other words, you can't say, I will surrender my license to avoid going to the commission they will not approve your application. If you have an inactive license, letter C, obviously there are things you cannot do. You can't practice real estate. That would be an active license. Now, you are also not required to do continuing ed you still have to renew your license even though it's inactive. If you fail to renew it and it expires, notice that expiration and inactive are two different things. Expiration means your license is gone. You would have to start all over again. Inactive means you have a license you are just not actively using it. So when that June the 30th comes along this year, you would have to renew your inactive license just so that you can keep it, so to speak. If you want to come back into active, I see this happen a lot with young males and females that are starting families, specifically the female that says, okay, I'm gonna, we're gonna have kids, I'm gonna be a mother, I'm gonna raise the kid, I'm not gonna really use my license, so I don't wanna pay the fees to my boar, I don't wanna do the continuing ed. I say, okay, move it to inactive. That way, you're not required to do continuing ed, you're not joining the board, but you can't practice. And then the kid gets four, five, six, he goes to school, the mother comes back and says, okay, now I want to start practicing again. We can move it from inactive to active so that you can start practicing. To do that, you have to do the continuing ed for the year you're in, all right? And you would have to do any kind of post-licensing if you haven't taken that. Remember the 30 hour post licensing course? If you went inactive prior to taking that, you might have to take that course as well. You cannot receive any commissions, referrals, fees, any of that because you're inactive. Are we cool? Letter E. For those that are licensed after July the 1st of 2014, who would that be? You guys, you must take a 30 hour post licensing educational course within the first two years of having your license. So in other words, I'm going to see you guys again in the next two years sometime. You have to take a 30 hour course. Lashana? Now, do you just offer that 
at any any time? Is that online? How does that work? We have an online, we have a live version, and we have them throughout the year. Yes, you can take it the second week that you get your license. You may wait till the 12th month. You could wait to five days before your two years. It is any time your choice in that two year time frame, you must take this course. Now, here's a misconception I get all the time. It is not 30 hours of continuing ed. It is one course that is 30 hours long, much like this is one course that is 90 hours long. So you don't go take a bunch of little courses and add them up to get 30 hours. No, we have a defined 30 hour course that's got a curriculum that we have to follow. That is the course you would take. All right. If you want your license to be in referral status, let me, this may help a little bit. So we have this thing called active status. This is the status you guys want to be in, all right? You can get paid a commission. You must do 12 hours of con continuing ed. And you have to buy your license every three years. That is the one you guys really want. When you make your application, you come to me, I sign it, we check the little box that says active on the application so that you can be an active real estate agent. There's a second status called referral. This is the one we're talking about now. In referral, you can get paid for referring business, but you can't actively do it. All right. If someone comes to you, Sarah, and says, hey, I want to list my house, you would say, call Raymond, tell him I sent you, he'll help you out. When I close, I would pay you a referral fee. But you, being in referral status, can't list the house. You can't show the house for a buyer. You can only refer business. In referral status, here's the reason people take it. You don't have to do continuing ed. You still have to renew your license. All right. And then that third status that we just talked about is called inactive. You cannot get paid. You don't do CE, but you still have to buy your license every year. And when on that application, there are like four little boxes. One says active, one says referral, one says inactive, one says assigned, and you make application, you check the active box so that the commission knows that you are applying for active status. All right? So that's what referral's talking about. May not perform real estate activities, not required to fulfill your continuing ed. You still have to pay your fees. And when you want to come back active, when you want to go back into the status of active, you have to, now you will have to do the continuing ed for that year. Now, you will not have to do continuing ed for all of the years that you are in referral. Same thing with inactive. If you are in referral for five years and decide to come back this year, you only have to do the 12 hours of this year to become active. You would not have to do five years of 12 hours to get 60 hours to come back. You just do the one year that you come back. Thumbs up. All right. Now, an out-of-state commercial broker 
can actually sell real estate in Indiana as long as he does certain things. Now, and this is where I kind of say, think about the concept rather than trying to memorize all of these. Because if you understand what the underlying concept they're trying to tell you, all of these are very obvious. If a broker from Florida wants to come up and work in Indiana while he's living in Florida, he could get an out-of-state license or a non-resident that we just talked about, as long as certain things. So look at one through eight. If he comes up here and works, he has got to work under an in-state broker. He cannot have his own company because he is not a resident of Indiana. Remember all those requirements we just talked about for partnership, LLC, and corporations? One of the things I stress is must be an Indiana resident. This guy's not an Indiana resident. He's a Florida resident. So because of that, he has to work with an Indiana broker. Makes sense. He has to enter into a written agreement with that broker in Indiana. Makes sense. Can't work under without a contract. He must furnish the Indiana broker with proof of his out-of-state license. So the guy from Florida has got to prove to me that he's licensed in Florida. He's got to file that same form, that irrevocable consent to suit, that says he won't run to Florida and hide. Number five, he has to adhere to Indiana's laws, not Florida. He has to use the Indiana broker's escrow agreement. He has to use the Indiana's documents. And then I shall retain all of his documents for five years. So think about that, all of those. Understand what I'm saying. If a guy from Florida wants to come up here, he can do that as long as he's licensed and can prove it. He has to work with me. He has to fill a contract out with me. He has to use my bank escrow. He has to use my documents. He has to use my state laws. He has to adhere to my marketing because he's working now for me in Indiana. So all of those rules make sense. <clears throat> the same thing is true for an out-of-state salesperson. Remember, a salesperson is the entry level, like Florida still uses two levels. They use the entry level called the salesperson, and then they do a second one to become a broker. So if a broker wants to come, that's all. those are all the rules. If a salesperson wants to come to Indiana, it's the same rules. But there's one more that is added. The one that is added is this. I have to have that salesperson's broker's okay to, for him to do that. Same thing still applies. Salesperson has to work with an Indiana broker, has to file the consent to suit, has to use my bank, my paperwork, my uh, marketing, and I need his broker's permission for him to do that. 